Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of Talking Tech, Women and Girls in ICT. The Talking Tech series is brought to you by the ITC, the UNICC, and the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. My name is Rachna Reddy Mamidi, and today I'm really excited to be having a conversation about tech and tech careers with Simonetta Di Pippo, the Director of United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA. Previously, she was the Director of Human Spaceflight at ESA, and before that, she was one of the directors at the Italian National Space Agency. So she has also co-founded the Women in Aerospace Europe in 2009, and I have personally benefited immensely from this network. Uh, and I'm also happy to share that we have launched the VIA Berlin Local Group this year. So thank you very much for that, uh, Simonetta. Uh, so before we dive into the session, let me briefly introduce myself. I am a satellite development engineer working with Berlin Space Technologies. It's a German-based company that has been building satellites and subsystems for a decade. And I had previously uh, worked with the German Aerospace Center for a brief time. And before that, I was with the Indian Space Agency, ISRO, for uh, quite a while. And I also pursued a professional master degree in space law a while ago, just out of pure personal interest. So I'm doubly excited to have this chat with uh, Simonetta, given her role in leading all the space strategy and policy activities at UNUSA. Firstly, hello, Simonetta. I've uh, attended a lot of your talks and you are extremely popular in the space circles. So I'm really excited to meet you and do okay. this. My pleasure, absolutely. <laughs> so my first question to you, uh, Simonetta, is about space debris. And the ISS already had to dodge the space debris three times this year, like it does every year. And there are actually a lot of measures that are emerging towards mitigation of space debris, uh, like drag sails and so on and so forth. But there is actually a strong need to remove the existing debris. So do you think it will be political will or business interests that will first achieve success in cleaning up outer space and making it sustainable for all humanity? So thank you very much for the, this question. This is one of the topics that we are debating the most during, the, during these very days, even if I have to admit that this discussion takes place now uh, since probably a few decades. And uh, indeed, uh, there are a lot of political issues related to space debris. But what is absolutely mandatory to, to underline is that this year, not, not only this year, but in, in, uh, as an average, we can count 300,000 collision alerts every year, more or less. I mean, it's, a, it's an average number, which is a, a huge number. And it also gives you immediately the, the feeling about the importance of this topic because we consider outer space as a global common, which means that in a way we need to preserve it for future generations because if we want to really allow everyone everywhere in the world to utilize space, being a, an open resource for everyone in the world, well, we do need to work in a way in trying to keep more clean of the space environment. At the same time, we see an increasing number of uh, satellites launched because the number of players in the space uh, in the space arena is growing. So a solution cannot be to stop launching satellites. It's the other way around. So launching satellites and being able to master hardware technologies is key for a country also to develop from a sustainable standpoint and also have students linked more and more to STEM education, which is also a way of progressing in a way for a country, for a given country. So in reality, what we really have to do, as you were mentioning, is to try to mitigate on one side and trying also to clean what has been done already. Now, active debris removal is probably one of the most uh, difficult topics currently debated because the technologies needed in order to do so are quite critical also for other potential functions of, of, of a spacecraft, which means that we do need to regulate the, uh, the space environment. And that's the reason why uh, the member states uh, dealing with, uh, with the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space that we serve as secretariat, uh, they've been debating in the last few years this topic and last year, uh, they've been so good in putting together the first 20, 21 guidelines for, for the long-term sustainability of other space activities, including the guidelines related to space debris. However, you have to consider that uh, developing and, and building a satellite, a spacecraft, which includes the space debris mitigation uh, measures, 
uh, may have an increased cost because you, you need more fuel, you need to customize the design properly, etc. So what we really need is to bring all the stakeholders at the table so that the, also the private sector, which is increasing in terms of uh, in terms of participation, understands well that following the rules of the road is mandatory. So having a responsible behavior is mandatory to develop a commercial safe space, as we say, so that the commercial sector can flourish. And at the same time, we can maintain a space as a resource for future, for future generations. So it's a long process. You need all the players at the same, at the same table and we, the Office for Outer Space, uh, Outer Space Affairs exactly do, do this. So we try to be the platform for allowing this discussion. And also we try to connect the dots and trying to help all the players really to, to start their activities with a clear, responsible behavior under a clear regulatory framework. Thank you for that. So my next question, it's not very technical. So you've had an extraordinary journey, you know, initially you were an astrophysicist and now you are shaping international space policy and strategy and doing all this, you're, you're at the hem of all the activities. So my question to you is, as a woman who is in tech right now, what is your advice to young women like me who are working in tech, in STEM, not only tech, but in STEM, you know, engineers or scientists and researchers on how to decide, if at all, at what point to switch careers, you know, at what point in their careers to make a switch from core science and tech to managerial positions? Well, it's interesting because I don't believe I ever switched in a way. So the point is that if you really want to manage well at political level, you need to be able to understand the substantive matter. That's always been my point. So indeed, managerial skills are, you can apply them to several different fields. But if you do understand the substantive matter, your decisions are by definition better informed. And so you can immediately grasp which kind of path you have to take. So I don't believe I, I really switched. Yes, for sure, I'm not doing any more research or related to space science and, and astrophysics. This is true. But at the same time, I believe that uh, the reason why I'm so passionate about this job, even after more than 30 years in, in the field, and I, uh, I cannot say that I have the same energy, I probably have even more energy now than, than before in trying to put forward uh, all the activities, is because it's a continuous journey of knowledge. And I believe that the advantage of a, a, a job like mine, and that's the reason why everyone in the world should do something of this kind, not necessarily in space, but as you said, in, STEM, in a STEM-related field, is because every day you have to learn something. You cannot stop. You cannot wait for something happening. You have to be your engine for your own change. If you want to go ahead in your life, well, you need to learn, and you need to, every single day, and then uh, having, you know, an international environment, you have friends of every culture, of every, of every approach. I mean, you see a lot of things that you don't understand until you have the possibility to touch with your, really with your hands, what's going on. In reality, you learn a lot from um, a social, political, economic, and personal standpoint every single day. And so that's the reason why, I mean, it's, it's not a job, it's a way of living in a way. And when you ask what a young boy or a young girl, in particular a young girl, but this, in my opinion, applies also to boys, the point is that there are always a lot of people who want to tell you what to do. I mean, it happened to me and it still sometimes happens. <laughs> so, because there is always someone who believes that um, he or she knows more than you. So my attitude has always been to, I collect all the information, I listen to everyone, but at the very end, my life is mine. So if I take a decision, it's not a decision in favor of someone, it must be in favor of myself, which means with my approach, in favor of, of everyone, because I've been always working as a civil servant before at the Italian Space Agency, then at the European Space Agency, and then at the United Nations. So my civil servant approach is that I got so much in terms of 
knowledge and also in a way I'm privileged because I've been able to see the world, to have friends everywhere, to really impact the future. So I feel that I have to, to give back something. And if you have this responsible behavior in your activities, you find a lot of joy in what you do every day, even sometimes it's a bit tiring or sometimes you get disappointed or frustrated. But the point is, you need to do what you feel is the best for you. And when someone tells me, okay, I mean, I see that women have more difficulties. Well, it's yes or no. It depends on what you really want to do because sometimes an obstacle can be seen as a challenge. And so if you are able to overcome that challenge to solve the problem, then you are even more satisfied that if you don't have any challenge in your life. So at the very end, I'm very happy of the decisions I took and I will do exactly the same. And, uh, and the fact that now I'm considered a role model by young kids telling me, I want to be like you, is, is also, I mean, uh, you feel a little bit proud of what you've been doing because being a model for someone is rewarding per se. So overall, I will do exactly what I did and, uh, and I really hope that I can transfer my knowledge and my abilities uh, to the youngest generations, in particular women, so that we can put forward the next generation in the right direction, becoming a certain point in time, a multi-planetary species. Okay, that's, that's uh, very insightful. And since you mentioned working with culturally diverse teams, I also, I'd also like to add something here. So previously I was working in a governmental setup in India, and then I moved to the, the space industry in Germany, so which, is, which was a complete culture shock for me because the way people think, you know, culturally and from a government setup to an industry setup. So it was, it was uh, very, very challenging. And I, like you said, I've also personally, I've grown a lot by being with the people from different cultures. So that brings me actually to my next question. Uh, so the European space scene, as you already know, is quite open, you know, in terms of uh, nationality requirements. For example, I'm an Indian, so I'm not a European Union, uh, I'm not an EU citizen, but still I'm able to build satellites with a German company. Uh, but however, this is very different from the American sp space uh, scene. Whereas to work in an American company, one has to be a citizen uh, and, you know, has several nationality requirements. So how do you see uh, the future? Uh, do you see a future in which space sectors, not only in Europe, the US, but across the world, do you see them becoming more open and promote mobility, you know, geographically? Or do you think things will evolve to, be, to become more closed? Well, working for the UN, I have to say that I'm uh, very proud of working for the UN and trying, as I said, to bring back uh, benefits from space to everyone in the world. The, the point here is, is quite interesting because the more we go ahead, the more STEM education in fields like space are really becoming the center of gravity of the future because we have to deal with so many challenges. Apart the fact that we have this climate crisis, now the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, natural disasters, migration, the future of jobs, which is not minor, if you combine this with the so-called new frontier technologies, so I'm talking about artificial intelligence, including machine learning, biotechnologies, robotics, etc. So, all these new technologies will have an impact together with space technologies, which is innovation by definition, if you want. Space is innovation. Uh, I would say it's super innovation. In reality, we need to take our, all these challenges. And in order to do that, we need the best talents in the world. And therefore, if someone, a company or, or an NGO or academia, a foundation living and working for, um, for advancing the, the, the state of the world. All these entities and organizations need to get the best talents they can find. And if they find the best talent in India, well, they have to really focus on that and, and trying to get the maximum they can from the talents distributed in the world. And this will allow also, in my opinion, but that's my personal opinion, the more you do that, the more these intercultural exchanges will help the world to become more peaceful, 
because the more you understand the people around you, the more you are able to go ahead with an open mind. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the fact that sometimes what you hear, the negative approach with this or that, is not because there is a real negative approach, but it's just because they don't know what they're talking about in real sense. So the more we increase awareness about the beauty of being together and how really you can benefit from the best talents around the world, at that moment, uh, probably the, the, the problem will disappear naturally. I understand that the United States, they have quite a complex set of rules, even if you can find very good ways to contribute to the future uh, in the United States. And so each region, each country is different. Uh, but, but I believe that uh, sooner or later, this will be recognized as a must. So opening up the frontiers and having in particular, the youngest generation to be able to contribute to their own future. So you have an asteroid uh, named after you. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. quite extraordinary. So speaking of that, you've contributed a lot in science and research. And are there any challenges that you faced on a personal level uh, that you would like to share? I'm sure you must have crossed a lot of hurdles. And well, let me give a small example from my end. The most recent hurdle that I have passed is... So I set out my day with a task every day in the morning. I think I want to do task A, B, C, D, or let's say, you know, get the system running, that working, blah, 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 because I'm working in tech. And then when I, for some unforeseeable reasons, I'm not able to get the task done. So often I blame myself. So how I look at myself is, oh, I was not able to do task A, B, but I was able to do task C. But then I realized this is a big hurdle because in putting the blame on myself, I, I'm making it a negative connotation, right? So for, for me, what really helped is when I started looking at it objectively, when I started saying task A and B could not be finished, not that I couldn't finish task A, B, but task A and B could not be finished. So when I take so, so small things like this, very, very small things like this, uh, the perspective in which we view ourselves, so that changes a lot for us personally. So have you personally undergone any transformations that you would like to share with young women? Well, I was always determined to do what I wanted to do. That's to start with. But there was a moment in my career where I switched to, to a situation where I am not, let's say, stressed by even the most difficult situations. So I know that there will be, a, it's, it's a natural, you know, feeling and I know that will be a moment, not necessarily the moment I plan. Huh? That's interesting. It, there will be a moment in which I'll have all the information I need to take the proper decision. Sometimes it's not exactly in line with my planning, but I know that it happens. And so if, even if a task is not completed because I feel that I didn't have the, all the information to take the decision. So it was even better not to close it because the decision would have been probably not the best. In this manner, I never have the feeling that I have to blame myself for a task which was not accomplished on time with respect to my own planning. However, my attitude is that if something happens, which could have been done in a different manner, I'm not saying necessarily better, but in a different manner, the first individual I go through, did I look at the situation from a proper standpoint? Did I take the right decisions? And then after this analysis, then I go to step two and try to see if someone else around me did something that had to be done in a different manner. So the first step is always to look at myself because it's also a process that allows me to grow. So if you want, it's an also an egoistic way of, of doing it because it could sound that, yes, I'm, I'm very demanding with myself. That's absolutely true. The first one to be checked is me. And this helps me a lot in understanding if I make mistakes, not to repeat the same mistake again. It's a process that helps me to, to grow and, and also helps not to have the approach of saying, okay, it's not my fault, it's the fault of someone else. You, you often hear, okay, it's not my fault, and it's not uh, in, in, in my in my capacities, etc. Well, this is probably not the right approach because every time you say that the, the mistake is in the hands of someone else, you put yourself in a situation, okay, I'm fine, right? So I'm not going to, 
to check myself, which instead, without criticism, without stress, I mean, this is a, a process for, for growing, for, for really developing as an individual and as a professional. So I believe that there is nothing in nature which is stable. It's always dynamic. Uh, everything is dynamic. I'm an astrophysicist, so for me, it must be dynamic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no? Even at high speed, <laughs> I have to say, at particles and, and also satellites, etc. So everything is at high speed. But, but the point is that if you look at space from another perspective, so from more of a philosophical standpoint, and you consider the Earth as a planet, yeah. uh, which is one astronomical unit from the sun, which is a yeah, million yeah. of kilometers. And then you see that the other planets are far away. And then in reality, you have just this solar system, which is 25,000 light years from distant from the black hole in our Milky Way galaxy. And then you look at the galaxy and you see that the diameter is 100,000 light years, which means that if you fly at the, at the speed of light, you need 100,000 years to go from one place to another just crossing the Milky Way. And then you have billions, yeah. trillions of, of galaxies. So in this manner, if you think of what Carl Sagan was saying you now about the planet Earth, a pale blue dot, it's a very, a very, very, yeah. very small dot. Yeah, pale blue. So in reality, this changes completely your way of looking at life your day-by-day -day issues, the small ones, not the big ones, but the small ones, it's like that they disappear because you have a different concept with respect to your life, your role in, in the life of the others, the fact that you are really need to help. That's what I feel. I need to help the others because, as I said, I'm privileged in a way to do the job I like and to be able to really to impact, to have an impact on the future. And this is absolutely extraordinary. Okay, that's, that's uh, extremely interesting. So maybe next time I will also try to take this uh, pale blue dot approach to my problems and see. Absolutely, can, uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Thank you. So speaking of uh, all the astrophysical aspects and yeah. you know the enormity of the universe, uh, maybe I want to hop on to. Uh, science fiction. So my question is, do you enjoy uh, reading or watching any science fiction? Well, it's interesting. Not so much. In a sense, what I like are movies and books which are more science related. So even if a bit of science fiction, but the more they're close to real science, the better it is. So I like movies like, I don't know, The Martian, because he is doing a lot of things that not now, but in just a few years from now, can, can be done. So they are feasible. There is technology that we collectively are developing to do that. And then there is also reference to real missions, which are already landed on the surface of Mars. So apart a few real science fiction elements in the movie, most of the movie was really close to what can happen. So yeah. that kind of movies and books are really, uh, I, I, I like them a lot because it brings you a little bit inside the future, uh, mm -hmm. but with the, with the solid technical background. So at the very end, it's the same approach in my management activities. So I need to understand what's going on from a technical standpoint to be able to take decisions with the books is exactly the same. Then, you know, now we have all these streaming platforms where you are uh, plenty of... Uh, of this uh, space-related uh, science fiction movies in, in series. Few are interesting. A few others are, yeah, probably too, too science fiction. But, you know, why not? From time to time, it's something that I like. Yeah, because I often see that very few astrophysicists are into uh, hard science fiction, you know, like, like Asimov or all these elaborate uh, space science fiction. Uh, because for them, their everyday job or their everyday world is already extremely interesting so they don't really yeah. need a lot of fiction exactly so. <laughs> exactly exactly i agree <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well if you want what i like a lot to read is about economy 
I like a lot of neurosciences, biology, all other sciences which can complement the chemistry, can complement uh, um, my knowledge in STEM, uh, but also interesting, interesting books on, on different topics because this helps you to change a little bit the, the focus of your mind. And in this case, my mind is able to, to stabilize in a, it's very interesting how it works the our brain. Uh, so it stabilized the, what, what I have to deal with. And then it's a way for me also to find the solution to big problems. I change subjects, I do something completely different and my mind is able to find the solution. It's fascinating. <laughs> I'm fascinated oh, yeah. by my mind. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. So what do you think of long-term space travel? Would you travel to space or would you live on Mars? Or So two questions. Would you travel to Mars? Second, would you live there? Well, that's an interesting question in the sense that, yes, if is already something like taking a plane. In the sense that until that point, I believe I'm more useful in supporting the ones who are developing these systems. The moment in which this will become normal, a normal way of doing things, then I will be delighted to go to Mars, to go to the moon, spend a bit of time there, potentially come back. <laughs> <laughs> I like a paper dog. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I also like the idea of expanding our species beyond the uh, Earth limits. I believe it's, uh, we are getting closer and closer, closer and closer. And base is the expression of our creativity and ingenuity as, as humanity. And, uh, and I believe also that um, also the recent pandemic, COVID-19, but also the climate crisis is extremely important what I'm continuously underlining. We need to bring science back at the center. Science is mandatory for anything we want to do even to take all these important challenges that we are facing as humanity. Without science, without STEM, we don't have progress and we cannot tackle these this issues. So let's bring back science at the center. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm all for science, all for technology, yes. So is there any message that you would like to give uh, young women and girls who are watching our interview? Well, I believe, as I said, if others are able to do great things, everyone can do it. And, and I don't believe there is any difference. I never thought there is difference between men and women in terms of uh, commitment, dedication, and, and really interest in, in, in doing things. What I believe is extremely important is that each of us has to find his or her own way of living. And again, uh, it must fit with, with yourself. And that's the only way to have the best life possible because you feel at peace with yourself, which is exactly uh, how I feel. Uh, I've been feeling most of my life, I have to say. One point is that I always try to find a solution. If there is a problem, there should be a solution somewhere. And so that's what I believe is my contribution to the future of this planet. A small drop, if you want, in a big ocean, but I'm quite proud of being able to do so. And so each of you, in particular the young girls, should be able to contribute with a small drop in the ocean to the future of our planet. And why not the future of our solar system? It's a very nice message to take home. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? Yeah, I would like to, to ask you, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how you, uh, you ended up in working in the, space, uh, in the space field, what inspired you in a way. And, uh, and also, if I may make a comment, this interview has been uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. <laughs> and uh, I like the questions and also I believe that uh, uh, you, you do a great job in trying to to use people like me, use, quote and unquote, use people like me to really bring more the youngest close to STEM education. I believe the STEM education is really the key point. And so you made it, it very clear. And so you are also a great example of that. <laughs> also multiculturalism and a lot of different things. So it's been really a pleasure for me. But yeah, how the, the question is how you, you decided to... To, to work in this field. 
Okay, yeah, you uh, thank you for your kind words. You've, you've been very kind. Actually, my fascination with all this began when I was in my 10th grade. Uh, so NASA used to, and they still do, they organize these competitions for high school students. They organize a lot of competitions, and one of them was the Space Settlement Design Competition. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, like a 10th grade student, to think of a world outside of the Earth and try to build so we had a, so the competition format is also very interesting because every team, so there's a team of 12 to 20 students and so, and it's categorized into different departments, you know, some of the students build the settlement, some of them have to find the solution on where to build the settlement, some of them have to run the settlement, you know, all this planning for a school student was really fascinating for me. So that's when I got the space bug. And it's it's still very strong. <laughs> I'm really obsessed with space. I told you. I mean, when you are in space, you can live it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, fascinating. It's, it's, absolutely, uh, it's a way. Of many life. reasons also because it's 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 because it's a very small world, and I actually because I'm living away from my family outside India, I meet the space people, you know, more often than I meet my own family. Yeah. So. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all the conferences, events, and, and, it, it, and it's a very niche, it's a very evolving, uh, and, and, and it's also very powerful. You know, that there's a huge potential for space to solve so many problems on Earth, and every day we are uncovering it, and, and uh, it's, it's incredible. I just love everything yeah. space. So my entire news feed is space, and it's quite interesting. But, but like you said, Simonetta, I think it's also very important for people in space to... Uh, it's, it's exciting, all the tech aspects of it, but I think we should also really let, you know, like you said, the, 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 new, the research and brain, you know, the neural, uh, the science aspects of it, the economics and the business and how everything else in the world functions, because it's not just techn- technology that advances the world. And most oftentimes it's the policy decisions we take. Yeah that advances, that paves the way for what lies ahead for humanity. So I think it's also very important for people in STEM to understand the ramifications of their technology. Yeah. So, yeah. And in fact, you know, um, one, of yeah, the, but, yeah, one of the activities that, that we do uh, is also to try to adapt the various projects and initiatives to what is happening. You probably know that a few years ago, I launched this Space for Women project under the umbrella of UNUSA. And a couple of years ago, yeah, yeah. the Space for Youth competition. So this year was mainly, this year we were supposed to have COP26. So it was mainly on climate change and disasters, but we are growing with this Space for Youth initiative. So we really try to, to categorize things, even if they are all interconnected, but to allow then the various categories of our stakeholders really to be involved 100%. So. I am also happy that you mentioned uh, the Women in Aerospace Europe, which was created in 2001. That would have been myself, put, I mean, put myself in, in a way, in a helping mode, not necessarily being a mentor, but being able to connect people and to be also a role model. And I believe that also you are a role model because uh, younger, but already you did a lot. And so I believe it's also important that the others see it, I mean, look at you as, as a role model, because the, the role model not necessarily needs to, uh, to, to be, you know, already at the helm of, a, of an organization, but your, your profile, what you did already shows that, uh, you know, I know that the kids, in particular girls, sometimes they have a social environment around, uh, which doesn't help at, at all. Now, the fact that they, they don't grow with a solid understanding that they can really do what they want. Yeah. So, and that's the reason why when uh, yeah, under the umbrella of Space for Women, I applied the same approach of having a, a network of mentors all over the world. It's the same concept as uh, women, in aerospace, women in Aerospace Europe. The network, the, the platform for discussion, for connecting the dots, it's absolutely important or mandatory for the youngest generation to really understand what they can do. And if they have a question, they know that there is someone that they, that, that they can ask the question, right? So yep. there is someone that is able to answer. And this is absolutely fascinating. So I, I fascinating. I, I believe that you should uh, 
really consider yourself as a role model <laughs> and, and, and try to work also with us on the Space for Women project. Would, that would be great. Yeah, the, the VR project is incredible. And, and I completely agree with you. There's, we really have to put ourselves out there. That's why I'm also very vocal uh, about what I do in space, because uh, at least back in India, when I started with the space stuff, nobody had any clue that, you know, someone can have a career in space. And yeah. then now, but uh, now, for example, I get a lot of uh, people approaching me from family or, you know, all the kids, the little kids, they say, oh, you work in space. What's it like? Are you yeah. an astronaut? So, so they don't know, you know, there's this, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then the enthusiasm with which they want to know is it's amazing. Absolutely. So I try to do my, my share because there's so much I got from the community and I would want to give as much as I can back to the community. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly the same approach I have. So, yeah. So, thank you very much, and yeah. uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to to for all this conversation. And I hope that um, again, even if it's a small drop in the ocean, at least it's our contribution to the to the future we want. Yep. Thank you very much, you too, Simonetta. And I really hope uh, one of the events next that we will be able to meet in person. I'll certainly come up to you. Um, very Absolutely. glad we could do this. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. Thank eh? you. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.